right, so we want to talk about tidal forces here. I'm not going to rehash what's in Taylor. You can just read that. But I do want to look at it in a slightly different way. So uh, what I'm going to do is um, I have this little screen recorder that I got for my uh, Android tablet. All right, so here's what we want to think about. Suppose we have a star, and there's a planet orbiting the star. So there's a gravitational force on the planet towards the star, of course. And the planet's moving at speed v in the tangential direction. We'll use capital M for the mass of the star, little m for the mass of the planet. To move in a circle, the planet has to have a centripetal force of mv squared over r. And then the force on the planet is equal to big G times the mass of the star times the mass of the planet divided by r squared. So we can cancel out the m's. And we can cancel the r on the left with one of the r's and the r squared on the right. Take a square root of both sides. And we're left with v is equal to the square root of g m over r. So what does this say? Well, this says first that the the speed, if, all right, planets orbiting in circles, the speed of the planet goes down as you get farther from the star. You probably already knew that. And you might even have known the square root of 1 over r thing. I know I talk to a couple of you in computational physics about this. Um, so great. So we have uh, planets or whatever. This could also be satellites, say a moon, or even artificial satellites orbiting a planet. Um, if they're orbiting in circles, the farther away, the slower they go. What does this have to do with tidal forces? Well, okay. So I made uh, some Python simulations where I solved the differential equations, just F equals ma, where it's gravitational force. Right, so here we are. We've got this star in the center, and we've got two little particles orbiting the star. I do not include the gravity of the particles on each other because the idea is that they're very small, and so the gravity is insignificant. Um, one is slightly closer to the star than the other one, and if we let the thing go and orbit in a circle, you will notice, yes, surprisingly, the one that is closer to the star moves faster and therefore pulls ahead of the other one. So what does this have to do with tidal forces? Well, imagine that the particles were two points on a planet. As they orbit the star, um, or they could be two points on the moon orbiting the Earth, but as the planet orbits the star, the natural motion of those two points falling around the star would tend to move them apart from each other. And that's exactly what you see with tidal forces. You get a relative acceleration, so multiply that by a mass, and now you have a force, um, of two points um, relative to each other as a result of the difference of gravity on those two points. Well, okay, so that's interesting, but um, just for fun, um, I also started. I also started here with these two things the same distance from the star, so one is just slightly ahead of the other in the orbit. The way I did that is I put them at the same y and offset them the same amount plus and minus x. Um, so in this case, they're in exactly the same orbit. There's no force on each other, so you would expect them just to nicely orbit in a circle. And sure enough, they orbit in exactly the same circle. You can see that the red and blue trails are exactly on top of each other, and it looks a little jagged just because of the computer graphics resolution, whatever. And it'll just continue like that forever. It's not terribly exciting. All right, now, to connect this closer to tidal forces, I wanted to think, so, um, okay, what if we try to take into account the fact that the planet is held together by its own gravity? And, like a physicist, I'm going to approximate the planet holding itself together, however, with a spring. Because remember, from the simple harmonic oscillator chapter, just... Um, you can approximate any minimum as a parabola, and so therefore any potential well is approximately a simple harmonic oscillator. So I'm going to just put a spring between these two particles in order to um, in order to simulate the planet held together. So here we go. You've got the star. You've got these two particles held together by a spring. Um, there's going to be the gravitational force on each of the particles and the force of the spring on the two particles holding them together. So that'll keep them from diverging. So if we let it orbit, you'll notice what happens. Well, a couple of things. Notice that the spring, first of all, you, if you look at the trails, you can see that they got farther apart and closer together. Um, let me go back and just do that again. So watch as it starts. You notice they get closer together and then farther apart. Well, no surprise. There was a different force pulling down on the blue and the red particles. So the blue one accelerated more than the red one. So the spring started to stretch. 
But notice the other thing is, is that it sort of wobbles back and forth, that the spring doesn't stay perfectly radial. So let's go back to the beginning again, watch it again. Notice that, that the spring doesn't stay perfectly radial, and that's the blue one trying to get ahead of the red one in its orbit, but it gets far enough ahead and the spring pulls it back. And over time, now this spring, actually this is not just a spring, it's actually a damp simple harmonic oscillator, and I made it critically damped. So over time, notice what happens is, is the thing settles down so that it's always radial, and they're at more or less a constant distance apart from each other, and it orbits in a circle. Right. So what happened there was the um, there was energy lost from the system as a result of the damper. Where did that energy come from? Well, um, the spring started at equilibrium, so there was no potential energy in the spring. So it had to come from the potential energy, the orbit, which means the orbit decayed a little bit. And this is one of these things you can get with tidal forces. The energy of the orbit can be converted into rotational em energy of the object, first of all. Um, is one thing that can happen, but it can also, as energy is dissipated in the tidal force, as the tidal forces cause stuff to slosh around on the planet, if there's any kind of damping, energy can be dissipated and orbits can decay. We'll see that more a little bit later. Uh, just for fun, I also did one where we started these two guys um, equidistant. So if you think about it here, it's, these things are almost in perfect equilibrium. It turns out, well, so the spring starts at equilibrium length, but because the force on the red particle has a small component to the right, and the force on the blue particle has a small component to the left, um, the spring will actually start to compress a little bit. But there's no difference in the force in the radial direction. So you'd expect the spring just to uh, not rotate at all, maybe oscillate. You won't be able to see the oscillation because the way I did it, I could have pulled out the length, but I didn't do that. So, you know, it just kind of stays in the same circle. But here's the thing, as you watch it, it turns out that this tangential orientation is an unstable equilibrium. And that small numerical errors, see, there it goes, small numerical errors in the calculation eventually build up and pull it out of that unstable equilibrium, and it starts wobbling back and forth. And eventually, it will line up again radially. So this sort of, sort of radial orientation is a stable equilibrium. Um, in the accelerated reference frame of the planet as it goes around the star. So that's kind of an interesting thing that comes out of these tidal forces. Now, finally, to make it even more exciting, because excitement is my middle name, um, that's such a lie, um, what I did is I actually started it with the planets moving a little bit too fast. I started with the planets moving a little bit too fast. Um, so here it is, same thing. But notice when, when the thing starts, they're going too fast. So it's going to be, the whole thing's going to be in an elliptical orbit. So as watch as it goes, you will notice at the bottom, it's much farther um, than the top. And look at that. They even rotated all the way around as they did that. And all right, so what this green thing I just put up is, is just the, the path of the first orbit. I just put that up there for comparison as the thing goes along. And as you watch, you notice it keeps rotating back and forth. But here's another thing. Just notice notice that the ellipse is processing. What does that mean? That means that the ellipse started with the most distant point at the bottom and the closest point at the top, but you'll notice as it goes along now, um, the most distant point is now, and in, in the closest point is actually oriented at an angle um, tilted to the right. Um, so the whole ellipse is processing. If it was just one point mass or orbiting the star, the thing would always stay exactly in the ellipse that it started it. But when you have these tidal forces, it can cause the entire orbit to shift as a result of the tidal forces. And you'll notice that the um, this is a critically damp spring. You'll notice that the back and forth wobbling lasted longer than it did with the circular orbit. So what's happening when it's in an elliptical orbit, when it's um, closer to the star versus farther from the star, the gravity gradient is different. So the tidal forces are changing over the course of the orbit. So there's never a perfect equilibrium length for the spring. So as long as you keep the orbit um, elliptical, you're going to keep the thing wobbling a little bit. And that's how, for example, the moon Io um, orbiting very close to Jupiter, it's not in a perfect circle, so it can get tidally locked. That's what happened in this first simulation where the thing is just oriented radially and the same side always faces the star. But it always has a little bit of wobbling back and forth and that puts energy into the planet, which is why Io, or Eo, I don't know how to pronounce it, is so volcanically active. So I did one more thing. Um, the other thing is I just let this simulation run for a very long time and at a much later time of, uh, you know, 15 or 1600 time units, um, I just 
uh, grabbed another video here. And if you look at this, you will notice now that they're orbiting in much closer to a circle than where they started. I don't think it's a perfect circle, but it's much closer to a circle than an ellipse where it started. And notice also that the radius of the circle is less than the semi-major axis, which is just half of the long axis of the ellipse, was when it started. So two things, the orbit circularized and the orbit got smaller, which turns out is a lower energy orbit, even though the things are moving faster. Overall, it's a lower energy orbit. Um, this is another thing that happens with tidal forces. It will tend to circularize orbits. Um, and so this is a reason. This, and of course, it's not just tidal forces. There's other dissipative forces in the early solar system when there's all this gas that planets have to move through. Um, all of those, you will tend to expect planets to orbit stars in close to circular orbits. Uh, because there's dissipative forces that would tend to push them that way. Now, surprise, when we started finding planets around other stars, we found lots of circular orbits, but we found lots of elliptical orbits too. So things are never exactly as simple as you think. What's going on? Well, I don't know exactly, but one of the things that can happen is that if you have other planets, um, the interaction of the planets with each other can actually pull them out of their circular orbits. And especially if you get residences and things, um, you can cause them to stay out of a circular orbit, something like that. All right. Well, so that's all I have for the tidal forces here.